We told Tony what we knew. He looked surprised but not shocked, and then, as I had, laughed. Bloody hell, he said. Ron looked absolutely shattered. He ran through the story, how he had been driving back to London from Wales, wanted some fresh air, stopped at Clapham Common, went for a walk, met a guy, got talking, agreed to go for a drink, met up with some of his mates, agreed to go for a curry, got into a car, got robbed of cash, wallet, car phone, went to police, and here he was. He set it out in a very matter-of-fact way. Tony was in clear and decisive mode and said, the more I hear of this, the more convinced I am that as soon as people hear of this, they will think it all very odd and it will be very hard to explain away. I asked Ron if he had spoken to Chris, his wife. He hadn't. He called her and told her, in the most perfunctory way imaginable, that he'd seen Tony, who had been very nice, and he was probably going to resign and something might be on the news. All right, love? And that was pretty much it. I was the, the innocent victim uh, of a crime. The police were investigating that, but in order to minimise embarrassment for myself, my family, and to ensure that this government can get on with the business of governing this country with the very highest standards, I feel it appropriate that I should resign, and that's what I've done. NATO bombers have been pounding Serbia for six weeks to force an end to President Milosevic's systematic slaughter in neighbouring Kosovo, but it's not been effective. 600,000 Kosovo Albanians have been driven out of the province. There are reports of at least 3,500 people being killed in mass executions. Even hardened aid workers in Albania have been shocked by the arrival of thousands more Kosovan refugees today. They tell horrific tales of murder and brutality. Blair was in the forefront of NATO efforts to end the ethnic cleansing. This is not a battle for NATO. This is not a battle for territory. This is a battle for humanity. It is a just cause. It is a rightful cause. He said the visit to the camps had confirmed him in his view there was no way in the world of doing a deal with Milosevic. Britain believes there must now be urgent planning to sending ground troops, even in the event of no clear-cut peace deal. Other NATO partners are much less keen. It's President Clinton who's reluctant to commit ground forces, despite pressure from his close friend and ally, Tony Blair. We couldn't understand why Clinton, the ultimate empathetic politician, did not seem to get this in the same way as we did. The impression given by the British press is that Clinton is now a stumbling block to ending the conflict. The Americans clearly believed we were briefing against them. I tried to explain to the White House that people knew there were differences. The thing was to resolve the differences, not fret and frazzle over who was saying what to whom. I said for us to brief against them would be dumb and counterproductive because they can always hit back harder. The president himself then called Blair. They had spoken for over an hour, and the first five to ten minutes was taken up with Bill in a total rage. He said he knew what was going on, it was deliberate, and it had to stop. He said it may play well with the UK media and public, but there is a price to pay, and you will pay it. Tony said Clinton's outburst was real, red-hot anger. He felt he was just getting a lot out of his system, and he was the only one Clinton could really let rip with. Briefing Tony, I mentioned a story that was running about the menopause, and he suddenly looked pained and said, Cherie might be pregnant. I laughed out loud and said, I couldn't imagine having a baby at my age, let alone yours. Nobody can complain, you don't make news, I said. He said he felt a mix of pleasure and horror. Thank God I'm a Christian, he said. It allows me to assume there must be a reason, even if I can't work it out. 
what I dreaded was having to deal with all the guff that would come with it. The media would have a field day. They kept the story quiet for three months. The Mirror was first to pick it up, swiftly followed by The Sun. Each of them demanded exclusive rights to the story. Dealing with The Sun and The Mirror the whole time was like having two mistresses. It was a f***ing nightmare. Both thought they were entitled to some kind of special treatment. The Prime Minister and Mrs Blair emerged together for the first time tonight since the news of her pregnancy became public. There was something amusing about seeing all these hard-nosed characters standing outside number 10, going on about babies. Leo Blair, named after his grandfather, arrived just after midnight on May the 20th, 2000. I called through, spoke to Tony, who sounded very happy about it. I heard the baby and TB said, Here you are, Leo. Talk to your spin doctor. The media was going into meltdown on it, leading every bulletin, every spit and fart. Before Tony went out, he was incredibly nervous, but did fine, though they would no doubt have a field day with his mug, which was a picture of the kids. He still underestimated how much they gorged on this kind of stuff. She's sort of relieved it's over, you know, that's, that's the main thing. She's just resting now with the baby, but he's, he's been really good. He was boasting about how he'd been changing nappies. I went up to see him a couple of times and he was just sitting there holding the baby, all gooey-eyed. He and I must have spoken four or five times during the day, but usually about the political scene, which he was really running around his mind the whole time. He said we had to stay bang in the centre ground. I know I'm right. I am where the country is. Blair senses the government is losing the support of Middle England and in a decision that divides opinion in his office, plans to reclaim the centre ground in a landmark speech to the Women's Institute. I decided not to go because I had a series of meetings, including one with JP. It seemed to start OK, and I turned the sound on the TV down a bit as John and I talked over things. I was saying to Helen just before coming on stage, this is truthfully the most terrifying audience I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> um, Gordon Brown and I believe passionately in extending opportunity for all, but neither of us over John's shoulder I could see there was a bit of a reaction around the place and then the clear sound of slow hand clapping and heckling. I spent a long time working on the National Health Service. To try and make sure... Minister, speak out of politeness. Thank you very much. I turned up the sound and both of us watched as TV did what JP called his Bambi look really startled, but with the smile still there. Mr Blair's coming here today proved a public relations disaster. He's already having trouble enthusing... He called me from the car and said it had been really bad. It wasn't just the slow hand clapping, every element had been wrong. Their main complaint was that it was a political speech, to which I said, what did they think politicians were for? Of course, there was no way we would win a war of words with the Women's Institute. Things aren't going too well for the government at all. Of gimmicks and empty words and empty gestures and public relations exercises and they're no longer even competent at that. Haven't we seen in the last few weeks that he has now abandoned Middle Britain and that Middle Britain is abandoning him? Tony said we simply had to hold our nerve and have balls of steel. I said fine, but we shouldn't pretend that because we defend ourselves the whole time there are not things that we defend that don't actually need changing. He agreed there were problems and said it was possible we were in trouble. His own feeling was that we could lose narrowly. 
Tony Blair's powerful press secretary, Alistair Campbell, he's saying there'll be no wallowing or navel-gazing after yesterday, and the message will get through in the end. The idea that a few women getting up and walking out of a speech somehow represents a sort of seismic shift in, quotes, Middle England, I think is absurd. I have read some guff in my time, but this week, I mean, Comparing it, <laughs> comparing it. You haven't read what we've written yet. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, I'm sort of, I'm on, I'm on pretty high guff alert for the weekend. That's true. But, I mean, comparing it to the poll tax riots and you know the ERM and Ceausescu's fall. I mean, it's pathetic. <laughs>